Excellent. Okay, so welcome everyone uh, to our. Uh, welcome everyone to, to our book discussion about uh, conversion disorder listening to the body in psychoanalysis. Uh, we're very happy to, to, to be here with the author herself, Jameson, and with uh, Professor Rodrigo da Fabian from the University uh, Diego Portales uh, and Nelson da Silva Jr. from the University of Sao Paulo. So uh, we'll start, uh, Jameson will we'll make an a initial presentation, uh, then we'll pass the word to Rodrigo, that will make the, the first round of discussion, uh, back to Jameson or not, that's up to her, and then Nelson, back to Jameson, and then we will open to, to everyone to, to make questions or comments or, well, questions. So thank you, and Jameson, the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone to being here and especially to Leia and Pello for organizing these events. Um, I think they're important since we've missed two years of SIP meetings, which I look forward to every year. Um, so we haven't been able to see one another. So at least these mark occasions where we try to remember the work that we do together um, and provide a bridge for um, I'm happy to hear that everyone's still waiting to meet in Cyprus, which has been canceled twice, um, and that we're still holding on to the fantasy of being together soon. Um, thank you to Nelson and Rodrigo for taking up the task of, of reading this book and for discussing it. Um, I'm really looking forward to engaging with them, but I also have to say I have some trepidation. I've, I've managed to avoid somehow um, discussing this book with anybody <laughs> since it's been published. It's been reviewed or I've done events, but it, it becomes a kind of teaching, not really a discussing of the text itself, which is very written. So, you know, it's funny because when I teach, I turn it into a kind of spoken discourse or a teaching, which is very different from the fact of having written a book or written a text, which in some ways is also very personal. Um, on the other hand, there's something important here, which is that it's very much a SIP book um, in my mind, which is probably not obvious um, in any sort of manifest way um, and represents what has been important to me about this organization. Um, first, I would say that it is a response to Monique David Menard's book, um, which is important to me and that I've been teaching again recently, uh, Hysteria from Freud to Lacan. I think it was one of her first books, no? Or maybe even her dissertation that became a book. Um, and in that book, it, you know, she obviously takes hysteria uh, and points out that through the symptom, a question of subjectivity and movement has to be kind of conceptualized by psychoanalysis and the difficulty of thinking subjectivity and movement together really becomes for her a philosophical question. And in some ways, the book takes off from that point. Um, as well, the first SIT meeting that I went to in 2013 in the Netherlands, which was the theme was normativity and contingency. I presented some work on the drive and contingency and clinical listening, a version of which appears in the book, um, but which was the beginning of starting to write the book, in fact. And then in 2015 in Brazil, um, I presented the probably the first attempt to write on the question of conversion using Agamben, um, which was, you know, I, I brought into discussion with SIP. So it really begins there. Um, in 2016, the New York conference that I organized with Alyssa Martyr, anybody. Um, she and I discussed the taboo on virginity, which is also a chapter in the book, but the whole conference obviously was on the question of the body in which I was, you know, still thinking through these questions. And finally, in 2017, in Paris with Beatrice Santos, um, that conference was on the death drive and the paper that I gave there um, took off from the chapter, which is on Freud's paper on the parapraxis from uh, the subtleties of a faulty action. And interestingly there, the question isn't so much the body, but the body of psychoanalysis in the form of its institution and the, and the continuing work of the analyst. 
Um, and the problems that if we ask a question about the death drive, about the body that it poses for the training of analysts and um, the question of the institution, but also the analyst analysis where the book comes to a close. I just wanna say that more generally, there's a lot of conversations with Marcus Colin, Alyssa Martyr, Patricia Garavici, Beatrice Santos, Vladimir Safatol that have been important to this book. So I just wanna kind of underline um, that aspect of things. Um, so I thought just to give an introduction to people and to sort of help give some grounding to the conversations that you'll hear from Nelson and Rodrigo, I would just bring up a few things. Um, and then I thought maybe I could read a part of the appendix, which I've never read before, and that um, amuses me greatly. So I'm going to share my screen for a second. Um, this. So the um, I wanted to bring up the quote from Freud that was important in the in the kind of beginning of the book, but also in the conceptualization of the problem of conversion hysteria which was the last time that he speaks about conversion um, in his oeuvre from what I, from the research that I've done. And it seems to mark its moment of disappearance. So it's the last time that he mentions it and he says, you know, essentially I'm not, I'm not gonna bother with this anymore. He says, this is an inhibition symptoms and anxiety in 1926. Why the formation of symptoms and conversion hysteria should be such a peculiarly obscure thing, I cannot tell, but the fact affords us good reason for quitting such an unproductive field of inquiry without delay. And seemingly at that point, the question of conversion disappears from his work. Um, in a way it had already disappeared. It's really something that he talks about in the very beginning and you know, obviously in the Dora case, but that isn't the focus of, of much of his work sort of after 1905, although it obviously makes its appearance here in 1926. And the points early on that were important to me was one, the question of conversion as a particular symptomatic configuration that seemed to speak to the symptom par excellence, the analyzable symptom that for Freud could become part of the analytic setting and then be analyzed as such. So essentially you start with a conversion symptom, it joins the conversation with the analyst. He says it literally spreads into the kind of space and time of analytic listening um, and then allows the analysis to come to an end. And the way in which he describes conversion is he says that it's an aptitude for transposing large quantities of energy from one sphere to, to another. And he doesn't necessarily say what sphere because it can be the body, but it also seemingly could be anything. It just means that you have to transpose it from one place to another. Um, and it's precisely this which fascinated him in the beginning and pisses him off <laughs> in the end, in which he throws his hands up um, and gives up. Um, you know, and so I was interested in what this aptitude was. Is it an aptitude that the hysteric kind of brings to analysis that we cultivate insofar as we hystericize patients? Um, or is it something also in the disposition of analysis and the difficulties of the analytic institution? So that's what's sort of forming the backbone um, of a lot of the work. I also became um, fascinated with this graph, which was an early one. It's the schematic picture of sexuality. I never saw, you know, as much as we love Freud's graphs and we go over them again and again, I had never seen um, anyone focus on this very much. And, and what really struck me was not just the somatic psychic boundary of which I was obviously had a question about, um, but the fact that the relationship to the external object so obviously in this graph has to return through the body. Um, you see the way in which it breaks back in, you know, on the level of the somatic. And that what was important for Freud in distinguishing conversion hysteria against, let's say, anxiety hysteria was the fact that the somatic, the relationship between the somatic and the psychic had this quality of being able to transpose. <laughs> from one place to another, from the external back into the body to the internal, from the somatic into the psychic. And then what he kept saying about anxiety hysteria, which frustrated him, was that it was the constantly failed transformation from the somatic to the psychic, right? And so at the time that he's reliant on something whose mechanisms he doesn't understand, 
he's using it sort of to push his thinking, to push his work, but that at the very end of his life, he says, I can't think about this anymore. But then he does take up the question of anxiety again, very importantly, in inhibition, symptoms, and anxiety, right? And then transforms his theory of repression. So I was sort of, you know, sort of following these waves of Freud thought, looking at these diagrams, and it's, it's around this constellation um, that the work takes place. And then the last thing that I want to just sort of mention to put up front is that in my recent kind of return to the question of the body, I've been teaching a course at the New School for Social Research on the body. Um, and then obviously with the pandemic in the background of all of this was, um, I, I was really struck, I hadn't read Freud's phylogenetic fantasy paper, right? The, the paper that he burned and that was rediscovered. Um, and Jacqueline Rose mentioned it in her 100th anniversary of Beyond the Pleasure Principle and conversion uh, hysteria came up in a way that completely surprised me and I got very excited about it. So in um, the phylogenetic fantasy paper, Freud has a little graph, again, something I had been working with throughout the book, but here it was in particular in relationship to um, the phylogenetic fantasy. And he says, what he learns from thinking about the ice age <laughs> is this series, right? Anxiety hysteria, conversion hysteria, obsessional neurosis, dementia, praecox, paranoia, melancholia, mania. And what uh, Jacqueline Rose and thinking about the death drive and the pandemic wanted to do with this, I just wanted to show you, because um, it makes me wish I had had all of this and could rewrite the book as always happens whenever you write a book. She writes, um, she's quoting Freud here at the top, man's response to such a brute curtailing of his drives was hysteria. This is Freud kind of imagining the ice age, the sort of, the sort of origins um, of the neurotic human. The origins of conversion hysteria in modern times in which the libido is a danger to be subdued. Man also became a tyrant bestowing on himself unrestrained dominance as a reward for his power to safeguard the lives of many. Language was magic to him. His thoughts seemed omnipotent to him. He understood the world according to his ego. So Jacqueline Rose says, I love this. Tyranny is the silent companion of catastrophe as has been so flagrantly demonstrated in the behavior of the rulers of several nations across the world today, not least America's soon to be former president, he who shall not be named. As if to say, I will save you, but you must make me king, not that such rulers save anyone. Not to mention the accompanying idea that the tyrant was the first hysteric, the idea of bodily panic as the unspoken subtext of masculine power is as unexpected and as progressive as any of Freud's thoughts. Note how political he is being in a text too easily dismissed as sheer fantasy, including by Freud himself. I suggest that we see this paper as a thought experiment, allowing him to take huge and unprecedented mental strides. Um, so I, you know, the book in a way plays with history, it plays with certain moments in philosophy, but I loved pushing this back to Freud's kind of strange history and the phylogenetic fantasy, and then taking that moment and watching Jacqueline Rose, you know, push it front and center to where we are at this historical moment and how we have to think um, of conversion hysteria behind the pandemic and behind so many of the kind of reactions that we're facing today. So it sort of, in a way, brought me back to the kind of Freudian origins of the text, but fast forward to me to where I couldn't have imagined um, this book going. And I just want to say, uh, you know, Paolo and I have been discussing, <laughs> figuring out how to present what was my book event when in 2018, um, I you know, did a kind of launch event in New York and I, I, I had a hospital. <laughs> this is my idea for the book event. I had a, um, a psychoanalytic field hospital in which we set up in a limousine garage, um, 20 psychoanalysts with cots and 10 patients each where they, they did a kind of crazy performance of analyzing these patients and putting them through a horrible hospital procedure. Um, and it was a lot of fun. The artist uh, Vanessa Place was involved and she created a kind of soundtrack to the event. And, and at the end of the event, after the patients had been through this kind of experiment with psychoanalysis, they had to leave and they came back and the doctors applauded them in a reverse scenario where it wasn't about the knowledge of the analyst, but in fact, the patient's survival of some idea of what the analyst wanted. They wanted the analyst to know, of which the only goal was to make it out the other end. Um, 
weirdly, I mean, that was just the event that we kind of, I constructed with a number of colleagues, including Todd Altshuler and Vanessa Place, but um, this hospital looked unfortunately and prophetically and somewhat strangely and uncannily like the hospitals that have been built around the world for coronavirus. I mean, literally with the beds and the dividers in a giant empty room and the doctors all in white coats and in PPE. Because one of the things we did just for the staging of it is we had everyone in, in masks and those kinds of protective shells. So if you see these pictures, it's, it's very, very strange. And I do have to say that thinking of writing about the body, writing about historical reactions to the body and seeing where we've come fast forwarding, you know, years beyond obviously the writing and publication of this book. I don't know what quite to do with that. Um, it also makes me slightly ashamed of the book in a strange way. So in the name of shame, I'm going to read you just a little bit of the appendix. Um, this was written after writing the book um, and which you know, proves like a funny enactment. So I'll do that and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, one week after turning in a draft of this book for final review to Columbia University Press, I was rushed into surgery for acute appendicitis. It is true that I've been messing around with my body. I was on an extended clen cleanse and was visiting various healers. All of this after one such person recommended a mega probiotic that seemed to cause the peritonitis, exacerbated by a weakness in an already belabored, belabored sy system. This was very much my own doing, even if I conscripted others into the performance. I can't really say why I was doing this. The overriding concern seemed to be vanity if I was going to be honest with myself, yet there was some uncontrollable curiosity about this world which seeks to heal the body and is full of explanations for just about everything. I was playing at believing in it all, believing that gluten was evil and inflammation a contemporary malaise, which I still believe, that in search for an elusive pH balance, my gut biomes were in need of major intervention and that only infrared saunas could take on a plague of toxins. I wanted to believe and I wanted to figure out what was ideological as if the two could somehow be separated if I really gave myself over to the project. The problem was that I began enjoying the realistic, ritualistic pleasure of it all, including the concreteness of the concerns. Any day now, I will become a new person. Every day I could measure any number of factors, interpret waves of energy or excitement or lethargy as part of a massive process of transformation and these various self-administered cures. During the initial pains from peritonitis, I even insisted that I was merely in a healing crisis. You begin to see the circular logic. You also begin to see what is crazy about this management and administration of the body, whose only point in some sense is to test it or break it or both. All of this rationalization until the moment that I felt the pain localized in that infamous area on the lower right known as McBurney's point, and then promptly went to the hospital. Was this a way of dealing with this book which needed finishing for all that is horrifying about bringing a project to an end? Was it the necessity for a separation that took the form of a literal cut? Was it an addendum to my research about conversion disorder and the body, a hysterical sympathy for so many in a nearly insane quest for bodily purification? Did I need to lose an organ, even this supposedly useless or vestigial one? Or if I was going to push the question, perhaps we should admit that there is something dangerous about writing books because there is no metaposition. I am entirely inside the project about writing about somatic transformations and conversion disorder. The appendix was always going to cost me an appendix. After this whole fiasco sitting in my hospital room, I was reminded that Dora also had appendicitis or rather that a question of appendicitis had played a role in the ending of her treatment with Freud. The rediscovery of the appendicitis in the final sessions becomes the linchpin in Freud's session sent sense of the point in analysis where his hysterical symptom reveals, he says, its contact with an organic base. This place is where the sexual as such asserts itself literally then more than phantasmatically. We might remember that Freud's Dora case titled Fragment of Analysis of a Case of Hysteria was written as a supplement or appendix to the interpretation of dreams. More than showing the place of dreams in a psychoanalytic cure, what we learn about and what everyone remembers is Freud's countertransference. 
The fragmentary is not only about the nature of dream work, but the abrupt termination of the treatment by Dora. Not a whole case, a cut appendix. It is in Dora's second and final dream, the dream that leads Dora to announce that she is leaving the treatment, that the appendicitis comes into the foreground. In this dream, Dora finds a letter from her mother telling her that her father has died and that she can come home. After train trouble, a situation that becomes a strange kind of sexual geography, mapping the feminine body through the topography of the train, the station, the woods, Dora arrives home to find everyone gone to the cemetery and settles down to read her big book on the writing table. It is in her associations to this big book that we find the links to appendicitis. Dora recalls that at the time of her favorite aunt's illness, she received a letter that her cousin, her aunt's son, had fallen ill with appendicitis and that she should not come to visit. She went to look up the symptoms of appendicitis in a big book, an encyclopedia. Freud then recalled that after her aunt died, sometime later, Dora had an attack of appendicitis and recognized the special localization of pain that she had read about. Freud says that this is the one symptom that he did not regard as a hysterical production. Then, just as Freud is in the midst of describing the nature of the illness, reconsidering whether it was hysterical or not, he says he was about to abandon this track entirely when Dora suddenly provided the key, producing her, quote, last addendum to the dream. She says she saw herself particularly distinctly going up the stairs. She tells Freud that after her attack of appendicitis, she had trouble walking, especially on stairs, and that to this day still drags her foot, to which Freud cried, aha, the true hysterical symptom. Neurosis, he says, seized upon this chance event to make use of it for its own purposes. Dora's repartee to Freud's excitement is that the attack of appendicitis took place nine months after the famed sexual proposition by Herr Kay at the lake. Of course, Freud goes on to use this hysterical pregnancy as further proof of Dora's love for Herr Kay, not only treating the symptom too metaphorically, but adding to it his heterosexual bias. But rather her quest was around the body was bound to Dora's attachment to Herr Kay's wife, the same mistress with whom she had read about sexual matters in big books, a fact she hid from Freud for quite some time. Shouldn't we instead see Dora as attempting to restore her precious feminine desire through her hysterical pregnancy come appendicitis, this point of desire that had been excoriated in a plot that involved everyone she loved? Is this not the desire that Frau K helped her keep moving by talking to her about men, her husband, or his father, sexual matters, and children, leading to their extraordinary intimacy, to say nothing of Dora's complicity with the strange familial arrangement? Or perhaps better, isn't this the one way, isn't this one way of understanding hysterical pregnancy itself? The symptoms situated at this point of collapse when she cannot sustain an ideal any longer and must find support in her body a place in fact to prop herself up. Isn't the appendicitis like a nodal point of a web of complex identifications in the search for satisfaction with another? A point on the body that literally is her search for knowledge, knowledge of femininity, knowledge of bodies. Even if this is the spider's web in which she is caught, it is a web that she has woven and the desire depicted in the final dream seems to be one at least of separation from her family this is the place she had reached in her analysis through this persistent question about what a woman is and what a woman can have. Freud, it must be said, stays very far from this constellation, and we know that he fails to take into account both the place of Dora's mother in the case, her desire for Frau K, and he never inquires about what captivated her in the painting of the Madonna, nor does he ask her about her desire for a child. For it does equate with Dora's reading about pregnancy, childbirth, virginity, and so on, as he says, with a pun on her name. In another addendum to the dream, when she asks her father, does, where does Herr live? We know that Dora's name is Ida Bauer, and Bauer is an, indeed an ambiguous and improper word for a whole series of meanings that move metonymically from farmer to cage to cave to a room for women, habitat or home, enjoyment, masturbation, and finally semen. I asked Marcus to explain to me the German this <laughs> about 15 times. But indeed, what we see here is her asking, where? Where is the station? Where is the key? Where does Herr Bauer live? I'm really fascinated here by the fact that the one symptom Freud overlooked turned out to be the hysterical symptom that was the linchpin in the conclusion of her treatment. 
and one that Freud again throws his hands up in the face of this bodily element of conversion, just as he would 26 years later. At the real somatic eruption, not her hysterical cough, it is this that the neurosis seizes upon, and we find the most condensed point and crystallization of Dora's response to her analysis, pushing Freud into what he can't understand about conversion, no less working with female patients. Isn't there something so powerful in the play-by-play -play of Dora and Freud around this appendicitis? Everything that Freud can understand and something that Dora adds finally, I think a piece of her own know-how. Don't we see clearly Dora's capacity to work in her counter assertions to Freud's bumbling analysis of her appendicitis? Think here of her final remark aimed at Freud's satisfaction in his concluding statements about her pregnancy fantasy and supposed love for Herr K. Why has anything so very remarkable come out? I'd like to oppose this nothing remarkable that has come out to the increasingly intensified and localized um, sensation at the place of her final conversion symptom, the sensation of peritonitis but also by virtue of the images in the dream, Raphael, Sistine, Madonna, and finally Dora's question about her very name, where does Bauer live? Dora seems to have her sights fixated here, this cartography of the body, the attempt to localize something in response to her repeated question, where? What then was I returning to in returning to this case, my appendicitis for Dora's? My feeling is that it was something powerful about this mythical localization in appendicitis that is also close to the localization of desire, both in psychoanalysis, that hinges on a question where. Conversion does this. It is the localization that is the work of the symptom, its feat of condensation, and the power of materialization. But it is also the continued expression of desire brought to the point of a precise problem, namely feminine desire and all its bodily exigency. Perhaps to conclude, we should note that appendix indicates a small outgrowth of an internal organ, as well as supplemental material at the end of a book, both organ and writing. Coming from the Latin appendere, which means to cause, to hang, to suspend, it carries in it the meaning of appending, adding, subjoining, upending, as well as to weigh. In any case, doesn't all this point to my name, Webster, meaning weaver or spinster, a word that also serves as a derogatory term for a single or an old woman, possibly childless. Importantly, Webster as weaver through appendix traces the fact of separation that is behind every act of joining or appending, the very essence of a supplement. So even if this is a book on the body, we are never very far from the signifier, but we can't forget how literally a signifier must be taken, including the way it moors itself in the body in order to respond to the hysterical question where, by marking, by naming, by writing, by materializing. The ability to localize is the power of conversion symptoms, this special aptitude that writes itself into its own appendix. Um, I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you very much, Jameson. Uh, Rodrigo, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I prepared a, a short text that is inspired uh, by your book, which uh, as I will say in my short text, is, I, I find I found it fascinating and, uh, and very hard to make a commentary on, on your book also. So I will share, uh, I would like to share some slides with you. Uh, just a sec. Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. So my subtitle will be the body of knowledge and the living body, okay? Well, I have to start by apologizing. What I'm going to read to you today does not do Jameson's book justice. I must say that I had great pleasure reading it, especially because of the way it, it is written, which is in a psychoanalytical style. By that, I mean that, that the knowledge, which is everywhere in the book, does not silence her clinical experience, but rather it is summoned in such a subtle way that it becomes the perfect backdrop against which Jameson's psychoanalytical practice glows. But I must say 
the pleasant experience of reading such an extraordinary book was not repeated when writing this commentary. <laughs> I'm afraid that what I am going to share with you today, which are some critical notes of certain aspects of Jameson's book, has already been resolved in the book. While I was writing, I was haunted by a feeling of arbitrariness, of not hitting the mark. In other words, as in dream work, I'm afraid I have made the accessory the most relevant. That is why I think that this short and unfinished text does not do Jameson's book justice. But, and this gave me a little relief, I said to myself, after all, who or what can do justice to the singularity of a clinical experience? Having warned you, and especially Jameson, about what made me hesitate while I was writing these lines, I would like to begin with the most obvious question. What is a conversion disorder? How is this topic addressed in the book? I think that we can find in it at least two different argumentative threads regarding a conversion disorder, which however, are somehow related. First, conversion disorder is analyzed as a specific kind of bodily symptom and at the same time as the cure for that symptom. I quote Jameson, the goal of psychotherapy is not a removal of the pathogenic, but a new state altogether. In the greatest of tautologies in psychoanalysis, conversion must be subject to conversion. This is why Freud must abandon the cathartic aim, the difference between catharsis and conversion being the difference between momentary relief and radical change. In the second place, the book addresses conversion disorder from the broader angle of religious conversion. In this context, the book seeks to reinterpret the process of becoming analyst, that is the move from analysant to psychoanalyst, from psychoanalyst to training analyst, as, as a, I quote Jameson, quasi-religious turning point in the strange life of a psychoanalyst. I quote Jameson, Religious conversion is certainly bound up with a psychoanalytical sense of conversion <clears throat> and should not be dismissed as entirely different nor seen as part of a distant illusory past. Freud's dismissal of religion is to face you. The therapeutic, therapeutic era is more bound up with religious, with this religious return than we like to. So as a some symptom or the symptom cure or as the becoming of the analyst, conversion is the possibility of radical disorder and reinvention. By radical disorder, I mean the possibility of changing bodily existence, that is the onto-epistemological matrix that stabilizes our reality. In other words, from the classical hysterical, hysterical symptoms which show the possibility of interwining language and flesh, to the psychoanalytical practice defined by Freud as an impossible conversion disorder has problematized our given reality, jumping gaps and crossing borders that seem impossible to trespass, redefining our bodily existence. And it does not so by negating the, the impossible, but on the contrary, by unleashing its power of disorder, of dissolving any given reality, opening new possibilities of becoming. In this context, the question of the body and its presence and function in analysis becomes crucial for the book. Thus, Jameson writes, I quote, I have come to the conclusion that what is important is not what a body demonstrates or speaks, that is making the body a question of translation or interpretation. I have come to see in this body a surface that holds a degree of sexual tension that begins to define what it even means to speak, that is the body and its particular relationship to the unconscious change the nature of discourse and not vice versa. So if it is the body that changes discourse and not otherwise, then the question posed by the book is how are we going to get close to the body? What does it take for a clinical practice to stop acting on the body and allow the body to act? 
Well, from Jameson's perspective, the main obstacle to move from a discourse-centered analytical practice to a body-centered one would be knowledge. In fact, a two-sided desire runs through the entire text. On the one side, uh, there is the desire to get close to the body as possible. I quote Jameson, the book would serve as a prayer in the direction of this body or the prayer as body par excellence. And on the other hand, there is the desire to get rid of knowledge, which seems to be the price to pay for prayer to be heard. I quote here again, I have a dream that I can one day find the way to get rid of everything that I think I know that I might be able to begin again. It is a regressive dream or a dream of regression, the search for fresh eyes, like the inverse face of a world that likes to think of evolution as a kind of learning curve on a path toward mastery. What would I find if I get rid of everything that I know? Therefore, one of the main topics of the book is the, this problematic relationship between knowledge and body. In this context, conversion disorder becomes the crucial concept to interrogate and problematize this relationship or better, this non-relationship between knowledge and body and the body. In what, I, in what follows, I will make a critical analysis of certain aspects of this question. In short, I have ma mainly two conceptual concerns about Jameson's book. First of all, it sometimes seems to me that the relationship between knowledge and the body is treated as a kind of dichotomy in which one has to choose between them. Perhaps this impression is related to the fact that the book is more dedicated at showing to what extent the analyst knowledge is an obstacle to reach the body than to explain what kind of relationship to knowledge would enable this possibility. And second, secondly, my critical approach to the book has to do with the concept of the body. It seems to me that the use of this concept sometimes overlook its problematic relationship with its ontological status, both in terms of its substance and its depth to the process of unification. So to begin with, let me try to answer with Freud, Jameson questions quoted above. What would I find if I get rid of everything that I know? That's the question posed by Jameson. In the interpretation of dreams, while explaining the way free association work, Freud shows how difficult, even impossible, is it is to get rid of knowledge. I quote Freud, for it is demonstrably untrue that we are being carried along a purposeless stream of ideas when, in the process of interpreting a dream, we abandon reflection and allow involuntary ideas to emerge. It can be shown that all that we can ever get rid of are purposive ideas that are known to us. As soon as we have done this, this unknown purposive ideas take charge and thereafter determine the course of the involuntary ideas. Thus, Freud asked his patients to put their knowledge aside, that is to abandon what he calls the purposive ideas which organize their conscious reflection. But purposive idea is a very bad translation. The Freudian concept is Zielvorstellungen, which can better be translated as aim representations. The, fact, the function of them is to create a border, a cleavage, and a certain knowledge between what can and what cannot be stated. The free association rule is an invitation to abandon this preconscious knowledge about what is pertinent to say in analysis to allow the train of thought to be organized by unconscious aim representations. So the question of going beyond knowledge in Freud does not refer to the conscious unconscious distinction, but to the possibility of thinking without the frame imposed by aim representations. To think, Denken, is an aimless associative drift among different associations. In the project for a scientific psychology, 
Freud shows that the process of thinking follows the law of association by simultaneity and is identified by him, I quote him, as a pure C activity. This activity is characterized by liberating the associative train from, aim from the aim representations and by producing satisfaction due to the transfer of internal energy and the complexation of the associative network. This leads Freud to one of his most beautiful and precise definitions of the unconscious subject. I quote Freud, Freud an organization has been formed in C whose presence interferes with the passage of quantities. If that passage occurred for the first time in a particular manner, that is in, in this graph from A to B, in a particular manner, um, the, this organization is called the ego. So the ego is uh, this interference that makes that instead of going from A to B, goes from A to alpha, beta, gamma, et cetera. That, that's, that's how he defines the, the ego there. So to think, uh, to think is the enjoyment of an aimless detour. On the contrary, aim representations select the associations that a chain of thought can include or should exclude. In other words, they establish the rule of what can and what cannot be thought, turning the open drift of the associative network into a closed system of knowledge. From the Freudian perspective, thus, to get rid of knowledge means opening the possibility of thinking. Following Jameson's perspective, this would also entail that thought should have something to do with the body. But Freud sets on the alarm signals. In the interpretation of dreams, he admits that there are no train of thought that are not organized by aim representations. Paranoid deliria, hysterical discourse, free play of ideas or fortuitous associations, jokes, etc. All of them are structured by aim representations. So what is the relationship between knowledge and thought? Does thinking has anything to do with Jameson's conception of the body? Is it possible to think? The question of the body in psychoanalysis is linked to that of unification. Pilar Palacios has recently shown that the concept of the body did not exist in the first Freud. What was at stake for that Freud was the soma psyche relationship, not the body psyche one. As can be seen, you can, the, the same uh, diagram that <laughs> Jameson just showed, which I, my student know that I'm in, totally in love with this diagram. So <laughs> I, I'm very happy that you, you, you brought it. <laughs> uh, so as, as we can see in, in the, the, the draft G you know, from 1885, widely discussed in Jameson books, Freud refers to organs, not to the body. The, the latter, uh, the body, began to appear 10 years later in the first edition of three essays on the theory of sex sexuality as the unifying and normalizing effect of reproductive sexuality and, continue, and, and then continue to evolve mostly linked to the Oedipus theory and the phallic function, and the phallic function. In the same sense, Jacques Alain Miller asserts that unlike the multiplicity of life, the body is the result of the unifying effect of the master signifier. Thus, my claim is that the aim representations operate as master signifiers, which produce the body of dreams, that is, a body of knowledge. Freud says that beyond all the severe transformation that unconscious thought must undergo to be dreamed, something is preserved. This something has to do with the symbolic body produced by master signifier. Like an inscription on a gravestone, the aim representation produce a unity that holds together beyond the imaginary existence of the body. This means that the hermeneutics of dreams that seek to unravel their knowledge can only approach, approach them as dead creatures from the past, as petrified modes of existence. Thus, at odds, with Jameson's book, my claim would be that the body as unification produces a certain knowledge. So if we get rid of the latter, we lose the body too. But 
What about thinking? Is it possible to think without knowledge or to say it in Jameson's terms? Is a knowledgeless body possible? A knowledgeless possible body possible? <laughs> Let us go back to Freud. In the first place to analyze a dream means unraveling the unconscious aim representations which created the rule of what could and could not be dream. This is the analysis of the non, not living body of dreams. But on the other hand, to analyze a dream means something different. It means not deciphering its hidden knowledge, but to confront the patient with the incompleteness of that knowledge. Because aim representation not only transform the open thought process into a close, closed body of knowledge, but at the same time, in their material existence, they perform the incompleteness of the dream. In other words, they are not only representations, signifiers, they are also marks in the fabric of dreams, open wounds that cannot be healed or signified. This is the other side of aim representation, which is identified by Freud as the navel of dream, the spot where it reaches down into the unknown, says Freud. So if aim representations uh, uh, frame the thread of thought producing a body of knowledge, the navel of dreams open disclosures, enable the possibility of a living thought in the seminar, Encore, Lagarde writes, we don't know what it means to be alive except for the following fact that a body is something that enjoys itself. Cela se jouit. It enjoys itself by corporizing, corporizing the body in a, signif a signifying way, in a not signifying way. The real body, and I'm almost done, in Lacan is neither the organic one, although it's related to it, nor the imaginary or the symbolic. As long as the multiplicity of life is always larger than bodies, it can only appear in them as their incompleteness, the incompleteness of completeness. In the case of dreams, uh, the presence of the real body can only be manifested by the act of dreaming in itself, by the desire of dreaming, as Freud says whose object is the infiniteness opened by the navel. I think that we are touching the conversion disorders body, which is not the unified undead body of knowledge, nor the biological living body, but the process that happens in between them, a double process of disembodying the petrified and unified body and the infinite process of carnal embodiment. The thinking body, Sejui, enjoys itself. It is not simply a living entity, nor a symbolic dead one, but a living body. In this sense, Jacques Alain Miller writes, we don't know what life is. He's, uh, he's analyzing the quote of Lacan that I just mentioned. We don't know what uh, life is. We only know, let's translate it the way, that way, that without it, there is no enjoyment without life. And why? And why not reformulate this principle as that life is the condition of enjoyment? But this is not all. It is precisely about life in the form of the body. It, it is that jouissance itself it is un unthinkable without the living body. Then we will have to clarify our formula. The living body is the condition of jouissance. Yeah. As a noun, I'm finishing, the body is knowledge and the grave of life as a verb that is as embodiment, the real body is situated somewhere between life and death. A life playing with death, says Deleuze. To approach to it, we don't, we, do not have, we don't have to get rid of knowledge. It will be enough to tickle the body of knowledge with some naughty thoughts. Thank you. <laughs> Rodrigo and Jameson, would you like to comment or to reply something or uh, request the word to Nelson? 
Um, maybe I'll just maybe I'll make just one comment, but then we can save our discussion for after Nelson. Um, thank you, Rodrigo. I, um, I was really moved by that. I in in teaching the in teaching Monique's book actually recently, she asks this question about the difference between the physiological and the erotogenic body that the, the question of hysteria kind of poses for her throughout her work. Um, and the points of confusion really in the history of psychoanalysis that we get into in the two. But I really like the way that you reformulate that division and the place where I'm trying to insert myself because I wasn't happy either with just simply the distinction between the body and the sexual body. And you know precisely why the question of philosophy and discourse and knowledge comes up throughout the book. So you're situating it between, on the one hand, the problem of the one of knowledge that we can't necessarily do without, um, that we can't simply collapse body and knowledge, but we have to work within this, I don't know, let's say dialectic, and that then yeah. pushing that into the unified dead body of knowledge, but not the physiological body, but then to living embodiment of the question of the body of jouissance, I think is, um, is right. And I think it's, it's where I wanted to push the writing. And so the writing takes place there. And as you say, you then yeah. get into the critical discourse that you wanted to bring today. So um, thank you. Thank you for that. And there's also something funny, which is the, I, you know, the idea of getting rid of all knowledge, I, I knew was the impossible desire, right? I mean, the question was rhetorical. <laughs> They're saying, I know we can't do this. I want to do this. So then what am I doing in this book? So I think you answered my hysterical, symptomatic question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so wait, we'll continue. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that was home. Uh, I will also share my, my text, even if it doesn't have so beautiful pictures as Rodrigo's, but it will help for everyone to follow. James' own book is inspired me, you know, it, it, it was a, it's very hard to, to do a commentary on that. I think that the, the, I needed to, 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 to use this kind of graphic reference. Yeah, no. This confession of yours uh, was a great relief for me because I, I was very, very, <laughs> in, it didn't help in that point, but well, let's try, let's start uh, here. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to speak of the pleasure of your book, Jameson, because it's written with irony and holds many uncanny surprises. And often I felt as having been caught and a kind of a glowing spider web, a spider webster, in, cast in the, into the darkness. It's brilliant and cunning, scary and magnetic and skeptical and amusing at the same time. I'll try to expose the sec sequence of a kind of a one-sided dialogue I have had until now, hoping that it invites some reactions. Indeed, the best model of dialogue is perhaps given by Freud in the text, Constructions in Psychoanalysis, a kind of an incomplete conversation between the analyst interventions and the unconscious reactions to them. A conversation mediated by a gap where no reciprocity is ever met, but still, Mutual affections can take place, revealing unexpected thoughts. Already on the cover, yeah, and thanks Rodrigo for showing us, uh, uh, one, finds, one finds a kind of a supplementary board of a Rorschach's test, on which I saw, and now I'm sure it is there, or believe it to see, a smoke sculpture of an extinct dodo bird. I'm sure of it. <laughs> two overlapped kinds of transitoriness or exposition to unpredictable vanishing. This very question opens the introduction of your book. Is not psychoanalysis already just the shadow of an extinct language and life form? Or was it from the start made of this fading material 
just like the stories people suffer from. We really don't know, but perhaps this is the possible answer for the improbable transmission of psychoanalysis over some generations. Once writing about irony in his book of Disquiet, the Portuguese poet Fernando Pessoa described it as having two stages. The stage reached by Socrates when he said, I only know that I know nothing and the stage reached by Sanchez, when he said, I do not even know if I know nothing, thus doubting the knowledge regarding the unknown, and this doubt in itself. <clears throat> I think that your book belongs to this upper ironic stage, structured upon questions and the analysis of the questions made. In fact, the idea of a strange non-knowledge conveyed by psychoanalysis is presented by you as a presentation of it on page 55. Quote, this, with this non-knowledge, this map held at the threshold of inside and outside, I imagined this book in the form of a cosmos the evocation of the body in bits and pieces, like a liturgy in reverse, not body as word, but word become body. The book would serve as a prayer in the direction of this body, or the prayer or as body par excellence. The same quote Rodrigo chose. This paragraph worked for me as a kind of a compass. It helped me to follow your daring decision to use conversion as a model to think beyond the clinic field and to use it to locate psychoanalysis taking stock of the unfamiliar point of view of bodies and steadiness. You perform this movement theoretically, clinically, and politically. And this is the first ast astonishment the reader leaves with your book, the uncommon extension of the conversion semantics. Indeed, you use it to put into discussion the end of a psychoanalytical treatment, the training of psychoanalysts, the transmission of psychoanalysis itself, and last but not least, the ways the current culture tries to get rid of suffering. <clears throat> For time reasons, uh, my comment will cling to this last thread of it. The one con of conversion as a cultural hermeneutics of psychoanalysis. On page seven, you make the unavoidable question in this domain and you answer it, quote, how does psychoanalysis create change? This is certainly part of what is at stake in this book on conversion disorder. Conversion is sense of a radical reinvention and the aptitude as Freud called it for transposing large quantities of excitation a process that has the effect of restructuring one psyche. To transpose something from one place to another creates a cut, a separation. Indeed, some pages ahead, you underline this very last statement, giving it a fuller power of speech. Quote, conversion is seeking not merely transformation, but an act of radical separation. So throughout the book, we are invited closer and closer to something in conversion that works for change and is even the condition of it, namely separation. A striking precise choice, I thought, for if I live in a time bound to erase all differences, then conversion is a precise reaction against this intention being at the same time an inverse diagnosis of it. Indeed, if pathologies are considered not only as the undesirable leftovers of culture and must be thought of as inherent products of it, they also reveal the way each society acknowledges what is treatable and rebuffs what is untreatable in itself. Commenting on Foucault, 
many pages ahead, you endorse this inverse criticism power of conversion disorders concerning our society. Quote, I cannot help but hear this erasure of madness is also an erasure of the body. Now I'd like to pass to more propositional considerations, which are mainly based on a very interesting chapter of your book, call it Coitus Interruptus. And this is where my side of this incomplete dialogue is hoping for a reaction. Present day culture in its new liberal version can be considered as a decided movement to erase difference. And we must agree that psychiatry is now better prepared to silence the noise of madness than it was in its history. In fact, it has almost finally overtaken these boring diseases boundaries and reached the human enhancement, enhancement paradigm. It was a long road and it was able to get rid of medicine and feel at home in its original and legitimate domain, namely the one of biopolitics. The new liberal management of suffering, management of suffering, translating it exclusively into the effect of organic pathologies, erases the social dimension of it, what entails a radical depoliticization of feelings. This approach presumes, states, and so creates subjects with no legitimate speech neither for their internal differences nor for external ones. It's clear how in this new liberal regime of erasing these differences resides a theory of the subject and also a theory of power. But we can no longer speak of a political theory since politics depends on difference. It's a new kind of totalitarianism that is provided with a power strategy based on the control of our drives. However, this strategy is not new. <clears throat> We can find the first examples of it in the 19th century, not so much in politics, but in a very interesting Christian group, the Unida community. It can be regarded as a natural experiment of simultaneous bodily, economic, and social revolution. And I would say an almost a successful eraser of a difference. The Oneida community was a utopic Christian group settled in a small city in the state of New York. It lasted for almost 40 years and reached a striking economic wealth. Curious is the fact that working was, was only allowed for three hours a day. They were perfectionists. In other words, they believed that it was possible to reach perfection in life and not only after death. Well, among the many interesting traits, there were three major social, social innovations. First, what they call it the complex marriage, which simply meant free love, an expression coined by the preacher and community leader, John Humphrey Noyes. In this community, everyone could have sex with any other member of it, but exclusiveness was forbidden. The complex marriage was a practice that depended on another one that was aimed at the control of men's sexual drivers. For instance, for since women's orgasm is by nature independent of reproduction, their pleasure and freedom were highly fostered by the community's democratic principles. So, they have to excel in what they call it male continence, a kind of coitus reservatus, with one important difference to which we'll, we will come back shortly. Beyond the obvious instrumental uses of it to control what would be an astronomical birth rate, it aimed a higher purpose, that of raising perfect children. 
And here comes the third innovation, the careful selection of the couples who would be allowed to have children. <clears throat> this, social, this social practice was called stirpy culture, the culture of the good, the good stems of humans. After they were weaned, the children were separated from their parents and raised communally in the so-called children's wing. But let's get back to Mayo continents. It was obtained by a train in a park. Women over 40 and supposedly less prone to get pregnant had the task of initiating teenager boys in the train. The goal for these young apprentices was to learn how to separate ejaculation from orgasm. It was believed that ejaculation drained men's vitality and led to disease. But pure orgasm was considered an elevated kind of love. Following the founder's idea, this method, quote, proposes the subordination of the flesh to the spirit, teaching men to seek principally the elevated spiritual pleasures of sexual connection, end of quote. It is tempting here to come back to Freud's ideas on conversion and mental diseases. For the mastering of the male continence practice must have been not only very difficult, but also potentially risky for their mental health. Indeed, if we follow Freud's hypothesis, we should expect that to find very high rates of neurasthenia, despite having done only a superficial research on the topic, I didn't find any traces of it. But this deadlock in Freud's hypothesis is solved by your comment based on a Lacanian point of view, which is against the idea that it was the sexual frustration of coitus interruptus that caused anxiety. Quote, in an interrupted enjoyment, the body feels the others pulling out or pulling away before any conclusion is reached, namely the sexual non-relation. You use lots of oxymorons in your book. <laughs> What appears in coitus interruptus is the embodiment of castration. This is why it is named as the source of anxiety by Freud. End of quote. Let's explore it. In coitus reservatus, both orgasm and ejaculation are avoided. Dionidas' male continence instead is based on the, on the strategy of fostering orgasm without ejaculation. Following the Lacanian proposition, the kind of enjoyment evolved in the purely spiritualized orgasm is perhaps an experience of staying within one body or of mixing it with the community or even God, thus a means of avoiding separation. In fact, from this point of view, we could consider the entire Onida society as truly decided to find ways for the avoidance of separation. Be it the one between earth and heaven, or, be, or that between flesh desire and friendship love, they always use behavioral separation as a strategy for the avoidance of symbolic separation. For example, the separation of orgasm and ejaculation, the forbiddance of separation of sexual partners from the rest of community, and the obligation to separate the children from parents. If we now quit the Oneida community and come back to our new liberal, new liberal culture, they won't seem as strange as they would, one being religious and the other lay. Indeed, as you put it, Biopolitics is a perversion of religious conversion, which was originally a personal religious transformation. We begin to see how the religious sense of conversion should not be separated from some supposedly secular idea of transformation. 
Both Onida society and neoliberalism are looking up for erasing separation. The pursuit of perfection before death, the subject thought of as a whole in itself, the fostering of having sex with the whole community, but belonging to no one, and so on. But our, our culture is apparently failing in it. And within this failure lies the improbable path for psychoanalysis. In other words, not by avoiding anxiety, by, but by trying to change something in the way we experience it. That can change everything. <clears throat> by the end of your book, you propose many new thoughts on, you know, on this possibility like this glaring suggesting about a genuine psychoanalytical erotic art. The conversion in society is critical. Not only it is the transformation of the super egoic gaze, but it is also the opening up of a different kind of object relationship altogether, to say nothing of the transformation in the relationship to pleasure and sexuality. Unfortunately, and even if there is still so much to be said from what I read, I must now interrupt my side of this rousing dialogue. Thank you very much, Jameson. Thank you, Nelson. <clears throat> I will say that after hearing you, uh, I, I was a bit frustrated that your text was not accompanied by illustrations like Rodrigo. Uh, I strongly suggest that if you if you yeah. were to present it again, you should put some images. Perhaps ask for Rodrigo's help to, to do that. And I think, How would you uh, picture that? That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and the successful ones. <laughs> uh, Jameson, please. But would like to comment. Um, thank you. Uh, but I've never heard of the Onida community. I, I feel really sorely deprived of um, this really perverse mirror to our current neoliberal state. Um, and I, 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 I think I need to investigate it further. Um, <clears throat> I was really, I mean, I, the, the chapter on coitus interruptus, um, which actually was one of the latest additions to the book and was very important to me, you know, comes from what you quote, which was Lacan's interpretation of this moment in Freud, which everyone makes fun of, that neurosis comes from, uh, you know, coitus interruptus or, you know, sort of failed orgasm, as it were, as if we all had perfect Reichian orgasms and we could finally not be neurotic. Um, but he says that what Freud understood in that moment was brilliant and which he says informs his work. It was already an intuition very early on. Um, that it was the expectation um, on the part of the person for some bodily communion with the other that then is experienced in the failure um, or in the separation from that person with their enjoyment. They didn't enjoy me. Um, that becomes uh, the source of anxiety and then leads to neurosis. Um, you know, of course, this is just Lacan's imagination, but I also think it's a brilliant interpretation of this early moment. <laughs> And um, obviously brings up the question of jouissance that's raised by Rodrigo. So I wanted, you know, before we turn, Alyssa has a comment. It's also worth talking about the name Oneida appropriates names as First Nation people. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? No, no. It's as far as I went, it's just the name of the, the city. They, they, they bought a farm on. Mm. A tribe, displaced tribe. Yes. It, yes, the, it, it does exist, the city in the United, in United States. It's a, a little city in New York State. Ah, Lisa knows the city. <laughs> the the Onides Community uh, Museum, Lisa. No, I've never been there. I just, I, I just thought it's important in the whole fantasy that yeah. this was one of the really important First Nations people. So it's immediately recognizable as an Indian tribe, and that 
that initial displacement of difference, it seems yeah. underwrites everything that follows in a colonial and imperialist layer on the story you're telling. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that they kept the name of the tribe that they are not and Christianized it seems important to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot. It's, a, <laughs> it's very interesting. I mean, the, that's why I also wanted to turn to the question of jouissance because um, obviously Lacan divides his definition of jouissance into on the one hand a jouissance that says one and another a jouissance that is more heterogeneous or other. And in the two, I guess I wanted to kind of think about that, the three of us together. Rodrigo, I mean, it's interesting that you went back to this uh, quote from Miller, uh, which I, I uh, you know, absolutely uh, agree with and find quite stunning. I, I don't know when that was from. Do you know what was the date on that, Rodrigo? Which text? The living. Sorry. The living. I, 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 yeah, I, I know the name of the text. It's uh, it's the um, Lacanian biology. It's the name of the text. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it it is within. I have it in Spanish. I, I don't know. It's a it's a where it's um, it's like a seminar. Uh, it's a. Uh, I can I can send you the <laughs> the name of it. It's about the real. The seminar is about the real, but the chapter, the lesson itself, it's called uh, Lacanian Biology. That's the name of the the chapter. It's a huge book. We have. We, it's like a seminar that he he did. Is it earlier though? It's not from the recent. No, it's from the two thousand. It's from the two thousand. The two thousand. Yeah, yeah, from the two thousand. Yeah. yeah. Because recently, Marie Helene Bruce, in response to Malaire's atrocious remarks on trans from my perspective yeah. um, brought she she gave some some thoughts actually about the body and the trans question today and she says that where psychoanalysis understood there to be the name we find the body and where psychoanalysis understood there to be the father we find the siblings you know, and it, it's within this kind of lament from that perspective of the decline of the big other, um, and you know, whatever the foreclosure of the name of the father that's creating all of the ordinary psychosis that we're suffering. Mm -hmm. um, and in that, in that moment, the body becomes something that's, that's just simply a problem. And in both of your remarks, the body, as I hear you reading it through my text, is not a problem or a new problem, let's say. I mean, it's a problem insofar as it poses problems for subjectivity and, um, psychoanalysis more generally, but it's also a place to find an opening, right? I mean, this is what you mean by the navel. This is what you mean by living embodiment. This is also what I hear um, Nelson <laughs> saying also about anxiety and the way in which the relationship between the anxiety and the body is a, a place where you're not simply in the communal fantasy, right? With God and with everybody else or in the brotherhood of man as the Malarians put it. Um, in this very beautiful reading of that, that moment. And the question of the erasure of differences, which we're very concerned with today. Um, Marcus and I were actually teaching Leclerc recently, and he has this very beautiful Derridian way um, of thinking about the body through, through four layers, which um, you know, is something that I think was probably on my mind a lot as I was working, uh, as I was writing the text, where there's, the heterogeneous play of pleasure and unpleasure, which is the way that he reads the body, both physiological and erotic. And he says, the moment that the mother, you know, touches the body, you, you have this heterogeneity. But when she leaves, you have loss and you have absence. It's on the basis of that loss that the object's then constructed and the object is, is signified. Hopefully, he says, the signifier can reach back down to this heterogeneity. And in fact, if psychoanalysis does anything, it tries to, to do that. It tries to find the place within signification that goes back and evokes that original difference. Um, and I think in, in Nelson's one-sided talk, you were speaking to me about that, about the question of the neoliberal um, erasure of that difference. And, and I think that Rodrigo was re-evoking it um, at the very end as well. So maybe that's a place for us to. Yeah. Yeah. One of one of the things I, I thought discussing with you is 
a, a problem in a, a regular problem in the translation of an expression Freud uses related to your problem, your, your, your book is the somatic compliance. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, not, it's not a real good translation. In, in any language I know, they have succeeded to render mm -hmm. uh, what is really a zomatisches entgegen common. Mm -hmm. What is a zomatisches entgegen common? That means that something comes uh, from the body's initiative to a meeting like halfway between uh, within the path between the body and the mind and the, and the soul. So uh, this is a, a very uncanny expression Freud used it. He could have thought of many other expressions, but he used this one, which means that there is a spontaneous, spontaneous uh, drive from the body to the representations, to the psyche. Mm -hmm. And this is something that maintains the separation, the gap, but also is a, a, a process uh, unpredictable, <laughs> is an unpredictable process, yes. Mm -hmm. This is something uh, I, I was always thinking about when I read your book. Well, I don't know how to 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 go yeah, for yeah. but uh, <laughs> yeah. No, but it, yeah. it's a really it's a it's a beautiful kind of um, I didn't know that reading of, of somatic compliance, but the terms always bothered me as if I don't know. <laughs> it's too passive, too passive to to passive. think of uh, some somatic compliance. It's too passive. But the body in the German expression is active. It's active. Yes. Mm. It comes in Gegen. It comes in Gegen. In our direction. <laughs> yes. You also see that in the phylogenetic fantasy, which I, I, you know, you didn't know I was going to bring this up because I, I've only been thinking about it lately and it's not in the book. But when you brought up the dodo bird, and this question of something that goes into extinction, but it, it goes into extinction precisely because of something that's pushed from the body in, in the kind of Freudian forensian sense of the evolution, right, of our species in this. Um, mm. and, and you have that feeling in that text. Um, you, have the, you, you have the feeling of the text that there's something both active and contingent on the side of the body that's in the process of the formations of history. Um, for it's constantly trying to capture, even with his crazy story of the myth of the father and the killing of the father and the brothers and all of the rest of it. It's about something on the level of the body that he then is forced to tell this story. Yeah, yeah it's very beautiful. Yes, this <laughs> point of okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe would like to uh, also react to what you're talking about. Uh, I my problems or my no, not my problem. My question begins one step before that, with the idea of the body as a singular noun. I I think that we we just. We, we, we talk about the body as something that's there, that it can uh, react or can act as, uh, as, was, uh, as Nelson was saying. No? But uh, I, I think sometimes we, we go too fast to the idea of that there is a body. You know? So you in English, you have a beautiful word with this embodiment. You know? And I, I, while, while, I read your, while I read your book, I, I said, why, why Jameson don't use this? Uh, I think you, you never use this, this concept of embodiment. We don't have that in Spanish or in French, I don't know. And I think it's a very interesting word because uh, it's, a, it's a verb. Uh, it's something that captures better the idea that, that the body is not something just given there, you know, that we can say it's things about it or it can react, but it's a, it's a, it's a process, I would say. Yeah. So, that, that's one of my, my points, and and the other point that I, that I which I, I talk in my uh, commentary was the, the question of the, the body and and, and unification. Mm -hmm. uh, well, 
which is related, you know, when, when, when we say the body, we, we are talking about something that has uh, borders and there's the body and, and the other, uh, what's outside that body. And that's, it's also very problematic, I will say that that's a, another thing that in psychoanalysis is not uh, something that is from the beginning, you know. Uh, it is not uh, in, in Freudian theory, I would say, uh, uh, that the, the first Freud, uh, uh, it's the, the problem of uh, psychisoma, as I would say. Soma, I, I, I'm not sure if the same as the body. He, he talks about organs, you know, in, in this mar marvelous uh, uh, diagram. And, um, and, uh, and well, it is, uh, the, the process of building the body is all the question about narcissism and the phallic function, you know, all that. So, so um, those were my, my, my concerns, you know, so, uh, so I, I would like to, 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 to ask you about this concept of, of embodiment. What do you think about it? Why don't you use it or? No, it's the right question. And I hear, I hear your concern about the, the like capital T body. Um, mm. And I think after I was done, I thought, why did I not use embodiment? I didn't, I didn't, I very, very purposely did not. I don't, I think probably a local problem, like a United States problem that, that embodiment is all the rage right now. And I had this aversion to it because when, I don't know, when you hear about it, it feels much too performative for what I wanted to speak about which ironically is what you're talking about, both the heterogeneity, the body in bits and pieces as Nelson's quote brought up, yeah. the organs, the skin, the flesh, the pleasure, the unpleasure. And I, I think you're right. I wish embodiment, I think for me embodiment speaks to that, but I didn't feel in contemporary discourse as if it would, and I avoided it. And maybe it was a mistake. Um, because I, I certainly understand why the body becomes a problem the minute that you hear it that way, as opposed to something that's an embodiment, that's a process, that's in movement, and that um, certainly invokes the kind of aimlessness that touches the Jameson, body. I think you're giving in too early. Okay. <laughs> I think Lisa. you should push back. Because <laughs> I, I, I do agree with, I do agree with your sense. Um, of the local problem. Embodiment has a whole set of connotations and is more conscious and more willed and, you know, I mean, mm. and it also has a philosophical legacy, you know, Merleau-Ponty and others phenomenologically. Yeah. Um, and I actually think that what Jameson's doing is closer to what you're describing. She calls it the body, but it goes through a lot of different transformations, it's not clear that it's as unified, um, Rodrigo, as I think that you that you tell it. And I have a question for you, which I don't know if I could formulate well enough. I mean, I was really intrigued with what you had to say about thinking. And um, that seemed to me the place where you were questioning Jameson of sort of what what is less about the ontological status of the body, because I think she could she could push back there, but more about, about what constitutes thinking and about that. Um, and and it, I guess what I'm saying is that I felt that you were formalizing or possibly totalizing something about the navel of the dream or the energies of aim presentations or aim energies. And it felt like like there was a retotalization happening in your redescription. And so I just wanted to hear more about that because for me, the navel of the dream is more unknowable than it turned out to be by the time you were done with it. So let's make a, a round of questions if it's all right. So Alaya wants to pose a question too. And Sarah uh, sent a, a comment on the chat. I don't know if she wants to elaborate on that a bit or if it's just a comment. Uh, yeah. Go yeah. On and, hi. Hi. And then Thanks. Um, after it's, oh, yeah. Can, first. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I just came in. Um. Yeah. It was just I um not too long ago finished a PhD thesis that part of the title I called it the trauma of the body and I deliberately didn't use embodiment 
Um, I'm not sure I had completely thought it out um, too clearly, but I think from a Lacanian perspective anyway, I was trying to introduce the idea that the body is always somewhat other. You know, we can never fully inhabit it. And I think something about the, the concept of embodiment, as Jameson was saying, it's all the rage. And I think there is something trendy in that idea that of this um, attempt to diminish the mind-body dualism, which I think we, we can never really completely diminish. Um, so, so yeah, I'd be, yeah, that was just my reason for not using um, embodiment. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Leah? Yeah, uh, thank you all for your great interventions. I'm very happy to see everyone here. It's uh, really nice. Um, James, I'd like to pose a question um, in relation to the comment made by Jacqueline Rose on the draft on phylogenesis. Um, this draft is very dear for me. It's very important for my own research on Freud and for my own route at SIP, at the, uh, for the work I, I, have, I have made uh, at SIP's context. Uh, the paper I gave in Newigen was on this draft. And I think it's very interesting, the comment made by Jacqueline because she says uh, tyranny always um, follow the catastrophe. And we know that this draft by Freud, it's deeply connected, of course, with uh, totem and taboo. And of course, we find there all this sort of uh, equivalence between culture and masculinity. And it has um, very heavy developments on Freud's thought regarding um, all of his theses on femininity. And so um, uh, what, what I'd like to ask you is something like this. Um, is this locus of tyranny in culture that is um, linked to masculinity? Does it overlap? the notion, somehow, the notion of hysteria. Do, ha, have, you, have you thought about this? Uh, if we look at the culture through this uh, equivalence um, with masculinity, and we find this, this thesis on Freud's thought, um, uh, does it say something about hysteria? That, that would be my, my question, yes. Thank you. Do we want, um, Rodrigo, do you want to respond to Alyssa about the navel and then I'll respond to Leah about the phylogenetic? Okay. Kind okay. Of well, thank you, Lisa, for your question. Of, uh, it's true. I, I, I think I, I, I went through that part too fast because of, of the time. Uh, so uh, now I have a little more time to, to, to talk about it. Yes, I, I think maybe uh, at the back of my head, uh, this is the, this reading that I made of um, Jameson's book is uh, has a little influence, I would say, with uh, some Deleuze and what are his what are uh, ideas. No, I think while I was uh, thinking about your question, I realized that <laughs> that was uh, somehow present uh, in my mind. And um, yes, the. the what, what, I, what I said about the navel and the aim, aim representations is that, um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I mean, there are two like, um, in the dreams, I, I will say there are these two points of concentration or these two points that the dream refers to, you know. Aim representation has to do with let's say this knowledge or the sense of, uh, the unconscious sense of a dream. You know? But at the same time, Freud speaks about this navel, which is uh, in, in a way it's the same place because it's a, well, the, the whole dream talks about it, but it's, it's, it's this impossible place. So the first difference of course is, is that the aim representation is the promise of closure. You know, it's the promise that the 
last interpretation is possible, which is not because there is the navel. That's what Freud says. And the navel is the opposite. Uh, it's it's open uh, to an infinite possibilities. You know. So the, the first uh, difference I made, you know, uh, uh, regards this this the the, the the idea that the same point in a way that that produces this uh, this promise of completeness, you know, is in a way the mark, you know, of the impossibility of this completeness, um, and opens to uh, opens the fields, the field of, of thinking, which is this aimless or purposeless uh, detour or drift, which uh, in the project Freud speaks, it, is as, it produces an enjoyment in itself. It calls it the enjoyment of transfer and complex, complexation you know, of uh, the associative network. But I realize I have, well, maybe, I don't know, but your question, maybe you're talking about this idea of this one point, even if it closes or if it opens, it's still a way of, you know, a certain way of totalizing or, I would say that, um, yeah, um, the, the, I would say one, one more thing about it. Freud, when he, when he describes uh, in, the, in this book how um, displacement works, he says something very interesting. You know, he talks also about the, the center of the dream. What, what, what determines what's the most important thing and what are the, 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 the parts which are, are accidental or not important in the dream. And they say displacement displaces this point. You know, between the 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 unconscious uh, dream and the, the the I don't know in English how to say the the the, the, manif the the dream that we dream. You know, the center is displaced in itself. So what is what is what is important in the in the unconscious dream can turn into something very accessory in the in the dream 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 dream. You know, and otherwise. So. I think we have to, to, to think about it, both things at, at the same time, you know, this, this, the idea of this kind of reverse of the aim representation that become not signifiers, you know, not any more representation, but this mark, you know, that opens and, 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 and puts, uh, opens this, the closeness of, of, of knowledge and opens the possibility of thinking, but at the same time, that this spot, you know, is displaced. So it's a double, you know, uh, openness or double uh, critique of knowledge, you know, and the uh, and, and 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 the knowledge close closeness. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think. I, yeah. I, I Thank you for I, that. I, Can I just I just want to add one thing, and then I'll turn it back to to Jameson, which is of course the other figure is not is a very Deleuzian, watery figure, which is the mycelium. It's the mushroom rootedness that goes with the navel, but yeah. uh, and this would be a longer, a longer. It's rhizomatic in it in itself, but the longer conversation would really be about the domestication of the dream work itself, because I think displacement is more complicated than just a center periphery or one transfer, and, and so how how all of the agencies of the dream work work together and where the dream comes from and when. Is is a question that has bothered me for a long time. But that would also be, I mean, Rodrigo in the beginning of his talk points to um, a very nice um, and flattering to an extent that the singularity of a given case or the singularity of psychoanalytic work that um, you know what I'm trying to do is in the mode of. I think would be the question about the way in which you hit the double face of this mark that you're speaking of was something that I tried to do in the clinical cases that I brought to the foreground in the, in the book itself. And that obviously would be a very sip like conversation to the extent, how does this theory, how do we see this theory at work in the clinic, right? And that might bring us to what Alyssa is saying about the both the, the the navel and possibility and impossibility that are represented at that place or what the relationship is between a center and a decentered center are um, with respect to thinking and action or psychoanalysis and process. Um, 
I really want to hear from Leah more about what's important to her about the phylogenetic text. I mean, one thing that's interesting about the, the Jacqueline Rose quote is that she says something that I think is wrong, actually, which I didn't want to bring up. Um, but she says that the tyrant is the first hysteric. And I don't actually think that that's what Freud says in the text. He says that the tyrant is a reaction to hysteria, that the tyrant is reacting to bodily panic. It's not that the tyrant is a hysteric. And you know, I don't think that we wanna equate masculinity with tyranny necessarily. And maybe that's something that takes place today and that there's a question of, let's say, feminine or masculine, masculine relationships to bodily panic, that you, we should separate from tyranny itself, interestingly. Um, and, you know, there's this idea somehow that, that, that the, and, I, you know, this brings me to, to thinking about Nelson, that the tyranny is a relationship to erasing bodily panic or the presence of the body as a response to catastrophe, right? And this important point that Nelson makes that we're, we're actually talking in these historical configurations or historical moments about what's treatable or untreatable or what's considered actually treatable or untreatable, right? Which is what's nice, I think, both about Freud's imagination of this original point, quote unquote, ice age, um, and thinking about what's happening today. Um, yeah, I would agree with you, yeah. Um, I would think of uh, tyranny as a reaction to hysteria, and hysteria by its term, is a reaction to the ice age because we have to give up the sexual satisfaction in that context. That's the supposition by Freud, right? right? But he also says in that text that language is something proper to the male. If we think of this uh, previous scenario and to, to, to the man, if we think uh, on the human field, and um, well, it's uh, very coherent with everything he says about the relation between women and culture. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I, I have a reading of this draft uh, that focuses on um, some um, philosophical deadlocks that I think uh, 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 Freud reaches when, um, when he's building all those theses on um, phylogenesis. Uh, I, I can share it with you if you are interested, but I, I would very much agree with you. Tyranny would come up in that uh, scene as a reaction to hysteria, yeah. But my, my question was about this. Uh, in all this Freudian view on culture, mm -hmm. that it's so, centrally marked by masculinity. Uh, if we come to analyze this and to take uh, uh, um, some distance from this perspective, uh, would, would it uh, force us to rethink the, the very notion of hysteria? And the hysteric is somehow situated outside of culture then, right? Or to the side of, or in the cracks of, in a way, or disidentified even with. It's interesting that, Brit, you, that you brought up that the, um, the question of being asked to give up the sexual or feeling as if the the catastrophe and the place then in which she's situated, maybe at the margins or in the cracks of culture, is asking a question about what is the place for sexuality then in this landscape? Yeah. And the response, the response of certain inventions like the Oneida, the Oneida um, religion. But I also thought of the Shakers because they give up sexuality as opposed to cultivating this practice. So Nelson, I think you and I should have a, we should have a Shaker versus the Oneida community. Um, we, should, we should write the difference between the two. That's a good idea. <laughs> That's a very good idea. <laughs> Only accept it. <laughs> yes. Well, we are nowadays living uh, planet catastrophe. 
then we should have some tyrannies uh, to follow it just after. If this hypo hypothesis stands up, I, I think we would think about it. Yeah. Well, there is all that problem of right of controlling women's desires. There is all that problem of how to control a woman's desire. And perhaps tyranny is also a reaction to it. This, this movement, constant movement, and, and uh, just like a spider, a movement that can go not only straightforward, but can go sideways too. It's, uh, I think the spider is a very good animal to, to depict. Yeah, history, because it has this, this unpredictability. It, it can jump, it can go sideways, it can go straight forward, and it can be very, very hidden in every, everywhere. It can be hidden. So I'm a little bit fascinated by this, this, but talking about animals, so you will all agree that this is a dodo bird. This is a, it. <laughs> this, this, Marcus, you wrote about the spider in our, in the book we're working on on Lacan. But there, in, in what I read about what Marcus wrote about, which he can speak about, but um, there was a, there was a, a fascination by Lacan that that there's a place in the body of the spider that produces the the web. Okay. I mean, you know, as if as if it's the place where it's localized. Mm. This production. It's an, I think it's another image uh, for the for the conference for the for the navel. The navel. The navel. Yeah. yeah. And to distinguish between the place from where, as if it were a center, the whole of the net emerges, and that center being part of the web, yeah. like the spider being part of the web and also the origin of the web. And it's the same paradox and the same dialectic that, that is unfolded by Freud in the Marcelino. Yeah. And, and Lacan was very fascinated. Like I, I, I've started to collect the passages where he alludes to the, to the spider. There's the famous one in Seminar 20, and there's some reference to Spinoza. And Spinoza was completely obsessed with the spiders, and he would have them fight against each other and, and it's a great <laughs> interesting history of the spider in, in philosophy and psychoanalysis. Yeah. Sadism actually it's like you know talking about culture and masculinity and domestication the, the Spinoza um, fascination is a is a scene of, of sadism and domestification mm. of, of that strange and uncanny element. Well, it's a, it's a great metaphor for our net also, for the internet. Yeah. Yes, it has also this problem of omnipresence and the problem of locating a spot. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, a good metaphor. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we're almost in our time limit so i think that perhaps we can end it here uh, it's, it's very clear that we could go on for hours but well, perhaps next time personally uh, in the, our next meeting uh, well james so thank you very much nelson rodrigo and everyone who thank you participated on thank you it was really great i'd like to invite you all again to our next book discussion on that Safadli's book Manière de transformer le monde de la camp politique émancipation. It will be discussed with Beatrice Santos and Marcus Cullen and mediated by Isabelle Tillier uh, on June 18th. So 
you're all welcome again. And well, that's it. This recording will be available in our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to share it in the beginning of this week, it should be already uploaded. And thanks again. It was very nice to see you well. It's always a pleasure. And see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you all. It was great to see you. Nelson yeah. Rodrigo, will you send me your texts, please? I would oh, love of course. To. Yeah. I will send you right away. Thank okay, you. Okay, I'll send it to you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.